Morning all, let's have a look at an absolutely classic game between Boris Spassky and David Bronstein played in the 27th USSR Championship held in Leningrad 1960. So this tournament was between January 26th and February 26th, a whole month of an all play all tournament which eventually cautionary by the way won the tournament. But um, these two are two of my favourite uh, dynamic aggressive players and I believe very very good friends as well. If you read uh, David Bronstein's book The Sorcerer's Apprentice there are, there are fond references to uh, Boris Spassky and uh, he got involved in various chess experiments etc that uh, Bronstein uh, pioneered. So e4 was played by Boris and after e5 they were both both David and Boris great exponents of the King's Gambit. In fact on this channel we, we have a video looking at some of the ideas that both of them are using in the King's Gambit and here Boris does play the King's Gambit. He's one of the grandmasters that really did make great use of this Gambit system uh, despite um, Fisher publishing a bust. I don't think that deterred Boris after he beat Fisher with the King's Gambit. So here it is accepted by David Bronstein. The pawn is taken. And we see knight f3 being played. Okay. Knight f3 means that queen h4 is not playable, of course. So it's one of the safer moves to play knight f3 here. d5 now from black. There are various defensive options available to black, but this is a kind of counter gambit giving back a pawn and creating a situation where both of Black's bishops uh, seem quite good. So after bishop d6 a blockade of White's extra pawn on that d file, supporting f4, and this bishop's good. And so uh, both sides have the e file to share later on in the game. White now plays knight c3, and now David Bronstein plays knight e7. Okay, so we see d4. Is white going to get back the pawn? After castles, bishop d3 is played, and it looks as though the knight is not helping the defense of the soft spot h7 in this position. The knight seems interested in perhaps helping protect the f4 pawn. So there's a slight Achilles heel in principle in black's system here that this diagonal seems more sensitive than usual already if black's really trying to cling on to this pawn making use of say knight g6 later. For the moment knight d7 is played. After castles we see another move which shows interest in just holding on to this pawn. If this pawn can be held on to then it's marking out some key squares which might be useful for black later. For example, imagine a knight later on e3 supported by a rook on e8. So this next move, h6, seems as though g5 might be of great interest. Here now we see knight e4 offering the d5 pawn, which is very interesting. So that's putting more pressure basically on f4 if this knight is going to take that bishop on d6. So we see knight takes d5 being played. And here, it looks as though uh, this is at some cost to white because black can also now consider knight e3 to grab the dark square bishop. So that pawn would have been useful in at least robbing white of the bishop pair. White plays c4 here. And then we do see this idea knight e3 just, just robbing white of the bishop pair. But, okay, after bishop takes, f takes, this bishop is also liberated seemingly quite dangerously on, on h2 potentially, but can it be kicked off that diagonal? The other issue remains, for the moment this diagonal is still sensitive, there's no defensive knight on f6 and there's a knight on e4 stopping defensive knight perhaps with an exchange if needed. So this diagonal is still sensitive. White plays c5, kicking the bishop away from this diagonal. Bishop e7 is played. I think intuitively bishop f4 may be running into g3 here that could be a very good option for white. But we'll check in the second pass uh, for these details. Bishop e7, 
and we see now bishop c2 really trying to set up a battery now on this sensitive diagonal you can imagine moves like knight f6 and knight g5 potentially being useful knight f6 well knight takes f6 that would help defend h7 but the principle still of the battery is really dangerous rook e8 is played and now the battery is set up in this position and black now just interferes or try to interfere with white's rooks this rook on the f file might also be dangerous targeting this soft spot so both these soft spots are being eyed now e2 is played and now a very very interesting move is played in this position perhaps technically best is rook f2 if white can get away with that without uh, any serious repercussions and slowly try and get the e2 pawn but can you guess what Boris Spassky played in this position which was far more radical if I give you 10 seconds starting from now okay well noted that knight f6 was not played was knight f6 so not knight f6 knight g5 is interesting because it does unveil the battery but then maybe you know knight f6 defending h7 just in time in fact Boris's solution here is knight d6 so he's attacking the rook and he's double attacking basically on the soft spot on h7 so if knight f6 he can at least win the exchange so this is now very very dangerous and the other slight downside of knight d6 is that an entire rook is being left and pre to the pawn taking the rook on f1 so you might wonder here why doesn't black take the rook and then worry about h7 okay and maybe a move like you know knight f8 could defend h7 so a very interesting uh, dramatic position and a similar position was was used in the, the James Bond film uh, from Russia with love so that's quite topical because it's the 50th anniversary at the moment in uh, November 2012 uh, we've just passed the 50th anniversary of James Bond and okay so Knight d6 is a stunner just leaving the entire rook and pre but it's not taken here so Knight f8 holding up h7 is played instead asking what again move your rook away but again there's a refusal to move the rook away in this position can you guess what is played here if I give you 10 seconds starting from now okay white plays knight takes f7 hitting the queen and encouraging the king to go into a double discovered check now black does take time to take that rook with check so rook takes f1 and is still left with this horrible discovery and double check issue which would seem to shatter his king safety for the moment he tries to extinguish some of the attacking power at white's disposal by playing the move bishop f5 okay this lures the queen now to f5 so it's a kind of drag and drop defensive tactic with the idea it seems queen d7 to try and exchange off queens but uh, Boris keeps the Queens on with Queen f4 and there's still a lot of problems now for black okay Bishop f6 is played and it looks as though the Knights the Knight might be forced to be uh, moving back here in fact it's just kept on f7 Knight f 3 e5 just supporting that Knight is played after Queen e7 we see further support for the Knight and another horrible discovered double check tactic being introduced with knight takes h6 on the cards bishop takes e5 is played after knight takes e5 check this is very dangerous now for the black king king h7 and now as we see in the james bond film this this subtle little queen move is very crushing queen e4 check and here David Bronstein resigned 
bit of a stunning game, especially with the rook sacrifice. In the final position, if g6, well, rook takes f8, would seem crushing. With queen takes g6, coming on knight f7. But uh, let's let's just check, uh, just with an engine, and go through the game on the second pass. So g6, yes, rook takes f8. So if takes, you have check, and then knight f7 is very, very good. That's forcing a mate in six, as well as winning queen. If king h8, rook takes f8 again, and there's a horrible knight g6 here, leading the queen, or just mating in two, actually. Knight takes, and then queen h7 mates is pretty. So it's absolutely crushing, this queen move. These diagonals are so weak, and the light squares around black's king so weak in this position. It's absolutely winning for white. Let's go back and see what resources technically black had at his disposal. So knight f3, d5, which is actually, the engine likes d5 as a second choice here against this system. So d5, e takes, bishop d6 now. Perhaps a bit more controversial than just taking on d5 here from this brief analysis, but um, bishop d6, okay, knight c3, knight e7. Now, if a move like knight f6, you might wonder, okay, there might be queen e2 check here, that is avoided by knight e7 being check. And here, if queen e7, d4, this is getting a little bit annoying. Because if black castles then taking and then taking on f4, for example, and then taking on f4, that's good for white. So that's why knight e7, maybe that's some of the basis for knight e7 being played to avoid the strength of queen e2. So we see d4, and now castles, and now bishop d3, eyeing that sensitive diagonal. So the soft spot is softer than usual here without the defensive knight on f6 knight d7 castles and now h6 is mentioned by the engine here uh, you might think well what about just knight f6 for example on knight f6 well part of knight d7 was to contest e5 so here knight e5 looks powerful trying to get back that pawn and say so this position takes takes Queen f3, then taking what would be okay. So black is trying to avoid that kind of position, maybe, uh, by playing h6, keeping control for a moment of the e5 square to avoid white playing knight e5. But we see now white offering the d5 pawn with knight e4. Okay, that's taken. And now we see c4. Okay, and it's given about equal by the engine on this brief analysis. This knight e3 looks like a good idea to do something with that f4 pawn, at least grab the bishop pair from white. Now c5, which does mean later this diagonal is free for action against black's king, but it does provide a backward pawn in principle on the semi open file and a blockading point on d5 in principle. But um, the importance now of bishop c2 is revealed for this battery and it looks like a dangerous diagonal. We see in this position rook e8 being played which maybe the engine doesn't like. I think the engine's implying f5 might be good and then try and at least block that diagonal. So that's interesting. It looks a bit shaky but um, I don't know why it's still got an edge here in this position. So in the game continuation we saw rook e8 and queen d3 now let's move e2. So if white had done a normal, sane, saner looking move, like rook e1, I think that would still be okay. Knight f8, rook takes e2, and, and white, okay. It's it's not uh, as flashy as the game, but uh, bishop f5 here, let's see, is knight f6 any good? Or well, no, there's a backfire on e2, so this makes, I think, knight f6 is not playable in this position. But rook a e1 and white's got a small uh, advantage still. On knight f6, I think this backfires with bishop takes f6. And the rook's hanging here. 
okay so bishop f5 perfectly pliable there's no little trick there and this would be okay for both sides but in the game we saw this stunner of an idea rook f2 is also given by the way as a strong move keeps the rook on the f file knight f8 maybe an improvement knight e5 and that's still an advantage for white and dangerous for black if we have this position okay rook takes e2 and the other one can come immediately to f1 maybe or e1 again advantage to white white's comfortable but the game made this game really immortal just just sacrificing the entire rook with check and it wasn't taken immediately so if it was taken immediately rook takes f1 now is there a defense knight f6 trying to hold up h7 like that here the engine really likes knight takes f7 in this position so let's have a quick look at this if king takes check bishop e6 check king g8 check it's actually uh black's getting mated with uh, the old queen h7 uh, check knight takes h7 knight g6 <laughs> that's an example variation this shows that the danger of these diagonals is really uh, magnificent really um, demonstration um, so if I don't know queen queen d5 that doesn't seem that promising maybe bishop b3 is strong as bishop f5 maybe even stronger okay technically knight takes h6 what's going on here if takes check check knight g5 this looks very scary for the black king and uh, what does black do here it seems to be the engine wants to give up the queen all of a sudden I think the threat is knight h7 because that knight's pins so that's a major major threat so that's hopeless for black so it seems uh, this position uh, after knight f6 knight takes f7 it appears that the engine thinks black is actually busted here if bishop e6 knight well just giving up giving up the queen is no good surely so that main line again king takes check is just really really dangerous here um, we didn't examine well say king f8 there's queen g6 threatening mate on f7 knight d5 is hopeless because it just runs into uh, well knight g5 discovered check and queen h7 so this this looks absolutely um, terrible okay so in this continuation knight f6 seems unpliable now bishop takes d6 I believe I've analyzed this before and somehow the video never surfaced on the channel maybe I got lost in the forest of variations and couldn't upload the video because this is complicated now uh, we'd have check okay maybe now check here is is not so hot apparently best is C takes that threatens mates on h8 now because the pawns stopping the king escape c takes check okay and I think we need to give the engine time here it seems as though technically this was a possibility for black here to encourage a very advanced drag and drop tactic for the queen to be on h8 and for the king to be on e7 in the process so rook e1 check with the remaining rook knight e5 Queen takes g7, it's hair raising. Complication here. Rook g8, queen takes h6. Do we really believe this is about equal? Queen b6, king h1. Bishop e6. Well, black has actually managed to connect rooks on the plus side, shelter the king from the e file, and okay. White's just uh, an exchange down though so it's given the power equal this position I think the availability of perpetual checks maybe okay uh, 
or even this position the exchange down on this on this brief depth might it's it's about equal really equal chances according to the engine here can't really say anything more than that but there's an availability of perpetual checks as well so if white really wants to draw maybe you know it's it's, it's, it's a draw at least so that's a very very interesting continuation which would stem from taking uh, the rook immediately after this knight d6 brilliancy move so taking the rook and not knight f6 but bishop takes d6 just inviting the queen in for lunch with the king so very complex variation there we have just witnessed um, not queen h8 that would actually give black an advantage here because this is this is significantly different now because king takes d6 is possible here and now c5 or rook g8 I would want to play c5 to give my king an escape back intuitively check king c6 it's still very scary looking but uh, in principle the worst would be over for the black king here and black is actually looking good so there's an accurate way for white to play it if he wants to secure a draw even in this continuation but um okay so that's uh let's go back to the game in the game knight f8 was played not taking the rook immediately so kind of bypassing all of that for a moment but still knight takes f7 given us a very strong move by the engine and that was what was played it blasts open this access route to the king this diagonal offering the rook still but it's all very good for white now it's the, the picture is so different now with this knight entrenched on f7 attacking the queen if queen okay bishop f5 was played in the game if queen the queen moved okay let's move the queen to d7 as an example well that's not very good because that's going with tempo so that's not a good example so let's we might as well move the queen to d5 immediately if we're going to go there bishop b3 and it's it just looks terrible it just looks absolutely appalling to go into this check for example check check bishop f7 ouch <laughs> well this this is just very very nice for white this kind of continuation so this queen d5 doesn't really help matters it would seem so bishop f5 is mentioned by the engine as a defensive uh, resource uh, so what is actually the distinction uh, of, of the possibilities see on, on queen d7 actually bishop b3 all, all this move was was strong and there's no basic um, challenge to, to at least try and get the queens off after bishop b3 it's, it's all over so in the game continuation what does actually bishop f5 do defensively after queen takes f5 queen d7 it doesn't really help black's cause that much to challenge the queen here um, queen f4 it does give black time though to shield that f file with bishop f6 in this position still white has got a really crushing attack taking the queen here as well queen e7 and we saw the move bishop b3 and apparently there's even stronger technical moves like queen g4 queen g4 threatens all sorts of things knight h6 for example uh, so if bishop g5 knight takes queen takes rook takes f8 is crushing if it takes here check check this just looks terrible that's a forced mating whatever there so anyway so bishop b3 is also a very strong move just giving what a massive advantage too so uh, and we see this continuation where blacks run out of uh, defensive resources and the light squares are dominated this bishop is really an exceptionally fine attacking piece with all these light squares weak that light square bishop is lapping up all of those light square weaknesses so check and that's all over and it's all over in the film as well 
the James Bond film from Russia with Love. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that classic and going over it technically as well. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.